a couple of the slides that we saw on Wednesday and then transition into the new material. A transition, uh, sorry, a, a reaction profile to an organic chemist is the same thing as one of these mechanisms where you see all the arrows being pushed. They are sort of uh, counterparts. We'll see in chapter seven very quickly and then for the rest of the two terms that you can describe chemical reactions in uh, great detail by looking at what people have done experimentally in the past and then deciding that I have something different as a product, I can measure what that product is, I can see what the structure is, and then I can work out how it happened. I can do experiments that work out the steps along the way, if there were steps, and if it's a concerted process, we can put the phone down at the back. You see, I can see everything. I see everything. Just assume I'm watching you. We can talk about all the experiments in great detail. We can prove these things. And that's a great thing, because we can actually look at the, uh, the, the experiments that were done. So we talked about two different types of process so far. We talked about what's called concerted, in which everything happens at once. And we'll see that you can have concerted steps in a bigger mechanism, but the simplest examples would be a concerted one-step process. Here, for example, in which this simple alkyl halide gets turned into a different alkyl halide that might have some use. And we go through something called the transition state. Starting on Monday, we'll start talking about those transition states in great detail so you understand what is exactly happening along the pathway. Uh, a lot to do here. Chapter 6 can be sort of... Um, it doesn't seem that difficult until you really get into it. There's a lot of stuff here. The other example was the stepwise process in which we have something formed in, along the way, what we call an intermediate. You'll see a lot of these. Uh, most of the mechanisms we deal with have this type of uh, uh, events happening. And we'll see now that we start off with an alkyl halide. On the previous slide, we started off with an alkyl halide. What's the difference? Well, the difference will be the structure of the alkyl halide, what it allows to happen, what it doesn't allow to happen, based on some simple ideas. Uh, but now we have multiple hills, we have multiple barriers. So we've got to worry about which one is the faster, which one is the slower, if you have multiple, uh, which one is the slowest, and what we'll, we'll call the rate determining step along the way. So in this example, we need to understand that the intermediate in the middle is not isolated, it's something that's formed in a transient way, and then it gets consumed along the way to a product. So now we've laid out the two different pathways, and we talked about uh, early transition states, late transition states, have an idea of what it is, think about it, and we'll talk about that as we go through each different reaction mechanism. And then what we did was stop with this. This was the last slide on Wednesday. And this is here to sort of measure where you are, give you a chance to sit there and go, can I handle all of that? Will I, by the halfway through next semester, be able to look at that type of thing and understand it so I can repeat it? Or I can think about it as a scientist or an engineer and, and, and mess with it and sort of change the outcome or change the uh, conditions and understand what's going on in that flask. So this is all about diving into a reaction flask or in a bigger system, diving into a cell and working out what's happening and why it's happening. Not just memorizing products, but understanding the steps that are required to go from a start material to a product. Now that's complicated. That is not as complicated as it will get, but that's where we need to be next semester and all of you have to take the two semesters, I do believe. Uh, we need to understand what these arrows mean. We have multiple types of arrows on this uh, scheme. We have these little arrows which are describing bonds being formed and broken. We have seen those a little bit when we did acids and bases, but that's going to be really, really important from now on. We see this type of re-arrow, which is a reaction arrow. That suggests a chemical change. We have to be careful when we use what, because they do mean something different. We have a start material here, we have a product here, we have some reagents here, we have a catalyst there. We will move on very quickly now into a whole bunch of 125-odd chemical reactions in which you have to be uh, conversant with the, the conditions and understand what that will do to the system. We have here some equilibrium arrows that suggest that the reverse step can happen. We already saw that with the acids and bases in a simplified sort of safe example. But now we'll talk about it in great more detail, saying that once we form this, it can also go backwards. We can have both of those things in the flask at the same time. And then we've got to worry about this, resonance arrows. Right? So on this scheme, you've got all of the arrows you need to be concerned about. And they all mean something different. They're all devices that allow you to uh, go from one side to the other. We've got an awful lot of resonance happening here. We'll talk about stabilization of intermediate species, what's allowed, what isn't allowed. But ultimately, we go to the product. And somebody might say, well, if this thing is reversible completely, how do you isolate the product? And the answer is you take it out. So we're dealing with Le Chatelier's principle. And if you remove something from one side of a reaction, what happens? The equilibrium has to shift to compensate for that, right? So those are ideas that you've heard of probably in the past, but we have to put into practice now. What we do for the rest of six, today and Monday, is lay out some parameters, lay out some rules of what can happen in organic chemical reactions, and then by extrapolation, what can happen in biochemical reactions. So we need some starter materials, and we need some reagents, and some things that will like each other, react with each other, and give you some different outcomes. Uh, the very first thing we'll talk about are two definitions that you will know from now on, something called a nucleophile, something called an electrophile. 
You need to spend a few minutes looking at what these mean so that it, it sinks in, you understand it. We've seen in the past that molecules uh, with carbon can be polarized. Depending upon what, what is next to that carbon, you can polarize that molecule in different ways. So on the left, we have chloromethane or methyl chloride, in which we definitely do have a dipole. And from that first exam, we tested you on that. You should be happy with this. Carbon is less electronegative than Cl. Cl is more electronegative. So the carbon becomes slightly positive. That is said to be an electrophile. So you think about the word file means like. Electrophiles like electrons. So if electrophiles like electrons, they tend to be positive. So electrophiles will be positive. We'll see positive carbon, whether it be delta positive or full positive, and that will, they will be the, the major sort of electrophiles in the two semesters. On the right-hand side, I have the opposite situation. In this example, we've taken a metal like lithium, and we put it next to carbon. We now have a polarity shift in the opposite direction, because lithium is less electronegative than carbon, and so carbon wins. And so a nucleophile likes nuclei. What charges a nucleus? Positive, right? So if you like something positive, you're a, you're a, a nucleophile, and that then is this guy over here. The carbon atom is electron rich for the nucleophile, and the carbon atom is electron poor for the electrophile. Spend five minutes looking at that, let it sink in. It really needs to be understood because that's the language we use from now on as we talk about chemistry. So definitions, electron poor, electrophile, electron rich, nucleophile. If you understand polarity and you understand in a few minutes the possibilities for what carbon can do here, be it negative or be it positive, this starts to get interesting. So examples of nucleophiles. What is a nucleophile? What's a good nucleophile? What's a bad nucleophile? We have to go back and we have to think about definitions of what constitutes stable and what constitutes unstable. Which you think is more reactive? Something that's unstable or something that's stable? Unstable, right? Unstable means reactive. It means too much coffee, too much energy. It's unstable. So I have here as a very gentle introduction to this. These are both nucleophiles. And to be a nucleophile, you have to have a lone pair. Okay? Or, in more general terms, you have to have a pair of electrons that you can share with something else. A spare pair of electrons. The most obvious ones are the bases that we've dealt with before. Pretty much anything that's basic can be nucleophilic. It can be a nucleophile because it has the same requirement. A base needs to have a lone pair, a nucleophile needs to have a lone pair. Or a spare pair of electrons that can be shared. So with that in mind, these both fit the bill. They are both nucleophilic because they have delta negative oxygen, and they also have lone pairs. Now, between those two, which is less stable? The one on the left, right? The ethoxide is less stable. It has extra electron density. It's like hydroxide. You know hydroxide is unstable. This reminds you of something like OH minus, and of course that's reactive. And this, by analogy, reminds you of water, which is much more stable. So the negative species, the, counter, the, the, the conjugate base, tends to be more nucleophilic than the um, associated acid. So now what we'll see is that this wants to share its electron pair by pushing it towards something else. That something else will be an electrophile. It wants to form a bond so it can go back to being neutral. So, so far, nucleophiles can be powerful or weak, depending upon whether they're charged or not. And we'll see later on that we'll bring in delocalization. Do you think delocalization stabilizes a nucleophile or makes it more reactive? Stabilizes it. So these are simple ideas that we've seen a bunch of times now we should be able to put together. So nucleophiles are electron-rich. The other electron-rich component that you spend most time talking about will be alkenes. We really haven't seen much beyond what they look like, sp2 hybridization patterns. But we'll find out now. Now, this pair of electrons in a pi bond is actually quite weakly held. You've got carbons here, which are holding on to the single bond electrons quite strongly. But can you see the pi electrons are further away from the nuclei? They're not right between the two atoms. And so it'll be quite easy, and a huge chapter coming up, in which this pair of electrons can be given to form a bond to something that needs a help. Some electrophile, some positive, delta positive thing, we can push electrons away from the double bond to that situation. So let's say this carefully. Organic chemists will think, of, will think of a pi bond as a lone pair shared between two atoms. Does that make any sense? A lone pair is situated on one atom. A pi bond is kind of like two electrons or a lone pair shared between two atoms. And they both do the same job. They both can be pushed away from an area of high electron density towards an area of low electron density. OK, so we've defined what a nucleophile is. Now we need to define what an electrophile is. And if you're doing the homework, chapter seven, chapter six homework is out there now. You can have a go at that over the weekend. You'll see this is fairly straightforward in little pieces, but trying to put it all together is the hard thing. Which atom in this molecule is the electrophile? Which needs electrons? The carbon with the delta plus charge, okay? So that might be my E plus. 
if I put it in quotes. That's my electrophilic center. That molecule is said to be electrophilic, but specifically it's the carbon with a delta positive charge that is the electrophilic, electrophilic position. So if I bring a nuclear file in, and we'll start using these little generics to do so, I think I'm going to attack the positive carbon. That makes sense. Negative goes after positive. Now, how many electrons did that carbon have to start off with? Eight. And if I bring two more in, that will be ten. So what has to happen? Chlorine has to break off because it wants electron density. It's electronegative. It's comfortable taking a negative charge. So as we build into the mechanisms, there's an example of a substitution process in which the nucleophile, whatever it happens to be, which we'll fill in later, uh, attacks the delta positive carbon and kicks out a halide. And that halide is good because it breaks off for the same reasons it was good for being a weak conjugate base. It's also good at breaking off like this. So there's one example. Now, we can also think of carbon as a full positive charge. Here's what we call a carbocation. This species here is something you will spend a lot of time worrying about. It's very much prevalent in biochemistry, so we need to be comfortable with the simple examples before we can move on to that. And we can now see that this carbon in the middle has got problems. How many electrons around that carbon? Six. So that thing is going to be pretty reactive. That thing wants some help. So where do we get some help from? Well, we can bring in some species, some nucleophile, which is electron rich and looking for something electron poor. This has what this needs. You form a bond. As we move into the arrows, there is logic to this. It is very much logical if you get it. If you don't, it's just a mess. Do I need to have a second arrow going away from that carbon if I bring in that nucleophile? No, I don't. Why not? It's got its octet. Over here, I had to compensate by losing something because it had its octet, and now I've over, I brought in too many. So I had to have two arrows. And over here, I just need the one arrow because that had six, and now it's got eight. Those are the things that you'll need to be thinking about in the very near future as we plot these mechanisms out, and you start to realize that this is very logical. Are we OK? It's Friday. The soccer team aren't here today, so it should be a good day. I don't know where they went, but they're not here. This is maybe our first look at really a carbocation. What does a carbocation look like? And what can it do? What shape is it? What's about it? Well, we think of a carbocation, and we can prove this. A carbocation is really an atom that is, has three bonds. Carbon has three bonds. And it's missing a pair of electrons. So let's think about this from the ground up. If you have four pairs of electrons around an atom, what shape will you be? Tetrahedral, right? Why is that? They, that's the furthest away those electrons can get from each other, which is the basic idea of VSEPR, valence shell electron peripulsion theory. Four pairs of electrons, tetrahedral. If you have three pairs of electrons, what shape do you adopt? Planar, trigonal planar. Now, what does that look like in the middle? It looks like trigonal planar, right? Like it did for an alkene. And what do you think the hybridization pattern is right there without looking at the bottom of the slide? SP2, right? It's consistent. Three pairs of electrons, you're missing that fourth pair of electrons, so that's going to be sp2. And what the um, positive charge is, is an empty p orbital. So you've got to remember that from now on. If you see a positive carbon, it has an empty p orbital, and that's where we'll be able to put electrons when we bring them in. That's where we deposit the electrons. So a carbocation, which is a very powerful electrophile because it needs help, is going to be flat, trigonal planar, and it's going to be sp2 hybridized. We're laying out the sort of parameters here before we start playing the game. So this is just a summary of the types of things you'll be looking for in mechanisms. Where is the nucleophile? Where is the electrophile? Where needs help? In other words, what's got an electron deficiency? And where can help out by having an electron excess? In this example on the left, we can think about inductive effects. In a carbon-lithium bond, it's pretty well understood that it's not completely ionic. And so if you think about delta positive, delta negative, lithium's a metal, it should be delta positive, the carbon should be delta negative. So we have a pair of electrons in this bond which will serve as the nucleophile. It may not be a complete lone pair on carbon, but certainly the electron density is towards carbon because it's more electronegative. Lone pairs, water is nucleophilic. Do you think water is a strong nucleophile or a weak nucleophile? Weak, because it's stable. It will be induced to get involved in a minute when we start doing reactions in which we involve a carbocation, but it isn't particularly powerful. What's more powerful than this? What's more powerful than water as a nucleophile? Related to it, hydroxide. Take off that proton. How do you take that proton off? Acid-base reaction, right? So we said we'd be getting to places where you did an acid-base reaction to set something else up. You can take off that proton with a strong base, make, turn this into hydroxide, and all of a sudden hydroxide is a strong nucleophile. It goes and does something else. 
So we're starting to build up the complexity here. The third example, which you'll spend a lot of time on in the, the very near future, uh, alkenes, double bonds. These are very good uh, nucleophiles. We can go after electron poor things, and we can form bonds that way. So we'll do lots of what are called addition reactions in the near future. The flip side of that, the electrophiles, anything that needs, anything that needs some help, anything that's electron poor. This carbon is electron poor because it's attached to an electron, uh, electron greedy chlorine. And this one down here is even worse because it has only six electrons. Those are the basic electrophiles you see in the first term. Second term, it gets more complicated because we head into carbonyl chemistry, but it's the same idea. Michaela? Uh, some will later. When we complicate things, you know, what we have to do here is analyze as much as we can. And there will be instances later where maybe you have a double bond, but at the other end of it, you have a positive charge. And the, the positive charge is more important than the double bond. We'll see things like that. All right. Going back to acids and bases, just to make sure that we're comfortable with these arrows and what they mean, we start off by thinking about the definitions we just came up with. And we think about this in parallel with the acid-base reaction. If you think about a couple of weeks ago, a month ago, we took basic pieces, Lewis bases, which had at least one lone pair to donate. And we said that they attack acids. And if you go back and look for patterns, the more acidic things tended to have oxygen, chlorine, bromine, iodine as A, things that were good at taking a negative charge, things that became stabilized when you took a negative, put a negative charge on there. So I have a very simple sort of electrostatic interaction here. I have a negative piece here, from a which is a base, attacking a delta positive hydrogen, and then something A breaks off. And if A is stabilized, great. Gives you a good conjugate base. And that gave me products. So I can use the same language now to go to more complex materials, more complex reactions. In this example, it's an equilibrium. We can go backwards because the base, this is the base. The conjugate base can go after that conjugate acid. This can break off, and we can go back. And where that equilibrium sat was dependent upon pKa's, which are dependent upon stabilities of the species. So if the right-hand side is more stable, what's K? Greater than 1. If the left-hand side is more stable, K is less than 1. Same ideas. Well, all we have to do now is replace the word base with the word nucleophile and the word electrophile. And modern textbooks, there are some textbooks out there that just call everything a Lewis base, because guess what? A Lewis base is a nucleophile, and a nucleophile is a Lewis base. So why do you need, this, the, the, why do you need all of these different terms? Well, that's the, traditionally the way it's been done. A nucleophile is the same as a base, because they both have a lone pair. And an electrophile is indeed a Lewis acid, because it needs electrons. It can accept electrons. They are the same definition. So if I plug in those terms now, and I think of this not as a base, but as a nucleophile, and I put some carbon here with some chlorine or something attached, I have the same arrows to describe the same thing. I'm attacking something positive with something negative, and I'm kicking something out. We're going to call that a substitution process. And we're going to use double-headed arrows. Okay, Double-headed arrows are these, because I'm dealing with two electrons each time. The bonds I'm making and the bonds I'm forming are two electrons. Later on, we'll do the single-headed, but right now it's all about two. So let's be careful here. How many of you drive? Too many of you. Okay. What side of the road do you drive on in the United States? Don't get this wrong. Did somebody say the wrong side? I agree. Absolutely, yes. Um, you drive on the right-hand side, yes? And in certain parts of the world, we drive on the left-hand side. And if you're not sure of which side you need to drive on, you shouldn't be driving. Now, this is very much like driving. Arrows start in a certain place, and they go to a certain place, not the other way around. If your arrows go in the wrong direction, it's like driving on the left-hand side in the US, or driving on the right-hand side in Britain, which I've seen. <laughs> it's, not, it's not good. Um, so be careful here. Learn this now. Learn this properly so that we get it right. It's a convention. It's the way it's done. Do it properly, avoid a car crash. So we're going to say that arrows flow from electron-rich areas. If I were to point out something that's problematic, it's this little idea here. Get used to it, from the nucleophile to the electrophile, from the base to the proton. Make it sure it's the same each time, and we'll be happy. So the book I like, and I, you, we've always got to remember that we choose a book for you to read from, not for us to read from, right? And most of the feedback I get about this book is it's fairly straightforward to read. 
compared to others which can be a bit dense. And one of the reasons I like this textbook is that if you were brand new at this subject and you hadn't seen this stuff before, it is kind of mysterious. And there is a lot of it. So you need a book that is, is readable and that you don't want to put down. Yeah? You don't want to just throw it away and say, I hate the book, I'm not going to read it. Um, the book and the author here lay out the really sort of important possible arrows that you will see over the two terms. And he comes up with a, a nice sort of condensed uh, idea here. There really are only four types of arrows, or four contexts for when you will use these arrows. And this is this, right? So this is an important part. If you're going to go home and study something tonight, this might be it. We're going to see four contexts, four different scenarios where arrows are used, and they will repeat themselves in these mechanisms. So if I went back to that slide with the big mechanism on it, we'd be able to pick out every single one of these four different types of arrows. And there really wouldn't be any more. This is on the homework to practice. If you're scratching your head about it, come and ask, and we'll get this worked out. So, Monday, we start actually talking about actual reactions, one of which will include this, where a nuclear file such as Br-, it's a nuclear file because it's electron rich, it likes positive things, will go after a carbocation, and it will form a new bond. And we could talk about energetics very quickly. Which is more stable, this stuff on the left or this stuff on the right? Stuff on the right, because everything has the right number of electrons. On the left, we have this positive charge. So this is going to be what? Exothermic or endothermic? It's going to be an exothermic step. Those ideas I hope will sink in over the next week or so. Well, this arrow right here is describing the progress and the approach of that Br- to that positive carbon. It starts out over here. It gets closer and closer. They start to interact. Maybe we go uphill in a reaction profile because we're starting to form something new. Uh, and we're going to end up ultimately with something more stable. But that is said to be nucleophilic attack. That's the first of our four different types of arrows that you have to look for. A nucleophilic attack is nothing more complicated than something electron-rich going after something electron-poor. And there will be many examples. Recitation, there will be many examples. Or homework, all kinds of examples. So that you get this now, so that when we get into seven, we're not lost. Do I need a second arrow to come off of this carbon? No, we already, we already answered that. You might in certain instances, but not in this one. I've gone from less stable stuff to more stable stuff. I'm starting to do chemistry. I'm starting to show the possibilities of what can happen in a chemical and later a biological reaction. So there's one example. Nucleophile going after electrophile. Joe. Well, think about this. What's, what's happening is reorganization, isn't it? It's going to have to go uphill. Every reaction we see has an uphill step or an uphill progression before we end up down in the product, whether it be endothermic or exothermic. You have to reorganize things. It takes time. It takes energy. It has to go from being flat to being eventually, what's the shape over here? Tetrahedral. Tetrahedral. That reorganization will cost energy. Well, ultimately, ultimately, once you get down to here, this molecule is more stable, so ultimately energy is released. Yeah? And we've got to, we've got, we've got to start thinking in a dynamic sense that Br- is starting to attack a carbocation. It's not, it's there. It's getting closer. They're starting to see each other, right? They're starting to interact. It's going to take a bit of energy to reorganize this thing, so we go uphill. We get to the top of that reaction profile, which we haven't defined yet, about all the detail. Maybe that's got some destabilization in it. I don't know. We'll see on Monday. But ultimately, when it relaxes and gets to its best situation where everything's got eight electrons, that's more stable. Yeah, on the downhill, right? On the downslope. So that's one example, nucleophilic attack. We've got three more. We've got some examples, and then we've got lots of practice. Second semester, 3720, when it really is cold outside. Nucleophiles go after carbonyls. This carbonyl here is delta positive. This carbon here, sorry, this oxygen is delta negative. So the electron rich thing, again, should go after the electron poor thing. And if I think about this now, I need two arrows. This is not mysterious, not making this stuff up. Most of what I tell you is not made up. Um, if I bring two electrons in towards this carbon, why do I need that second arrow in this instance? <coughs> Could you be breaking the octet rule? You must put two in and you must take two out, or else it doesn't work. And I end up with a, an example of a, of a fairly complex looking material over here, which will go further later on. But that initial attack is definitely a nucleophilic attack. This is more for second term, but this shows you some of the ideas that we can bring in now. 
we can explain the structure of this molecule by resonance. You've done this. You've drawn resonant structures to describe why that carbon is electrophilic, why that carbon is positive. And of course, it's because the atoms attached to it are more electronegative. So this is electrophilic, which can be described like that. And if I choose to take this nucleophile and go after that resonance structure, I get here with only one arrow. Okay? I would put a, you know, what on earth did he just say right there? It will become more apparent as we practice these things. The whole point here is that we're trying to get you to use the correct number of arrows, not too few, not too many, based on something as simple as the octet rule. Why don't I need to lose a pair of electrons from here if I attack this particular resonance structure? Because it's already got six, and if I bring two more in, it's got eight. And don't forget, resonance means the molecule actually looks somewhere in between these two things. If you attack either of those two resonance structures, you're attacking the same molecule, but if we're keeping a track of the number of electrons, you've got to be careful with the number of arrows, because you can get lost. So the second type of arrow. If I get through this today, I'll be happy. We have seen things break off in the original initial reactions that we said we'll see more of later. In this example, for some reason, not magic or voodoo, but it does actually make sense later, this thing collapses. This thing loses a bromine. Why on earth should bromine pick up a pair of electrons and not carbon? Well, it's more electronegative. And I will form on the right-hand side two species. Now, what do you think about enthalpy in terms of energy? Is that more stable on the right or less stable? Less stable. You've made this six electron thing. What about entropy? More favored or less favored? More favored, you went from one to two. And don't forget that gives us always a balance. So this might well work. This thing here is unstable. It will need some help. It will be a transient intermediate, a reactive intermediate along the way to someplace else. But the overall process here involved a bond breaking. And guess what? That thing left. It took off. So we'll call it a leaving group, because it did exactly that. It broke away, it left, that's a leaving group. So in this case, the Br- is the leaving group, and it's allowed to do so because Br- is a pretty good species. It's stabilized, you know that because of the conjugate acids, pKa, you know, the, know because it's large. So loss of a leaving group is the second example. And we can make this as complicated as you want. Don't worry about this just yet, this is 3720. But this is also an indication of where we need to be to get through 3720. It is a lot more in-depth than the first semester. In this example, I have a fairly complicated six-membered ring system that is losing a CL. And I'm showing exactly that. There's a leaving group breaking off. And I can also do this over here. There's a leaving group breaking off. Why do I need more arrows? Because I'm talking about different resonance structures. And if I'm trying to keep up a track of all the electrons, I have to be very careful how many arrows I use. So worry more about this for now, but realize for the future that's where we need to be. And again, this is the beginning of the really complex stuff, so if we're, if we're slacking and if we're not doing this in, in a, on a daily basis, it, it gets, it's no fun. Right, third type. Then we'll do some examples. Proton transfers. These are really fast reactions. Write that down. Proton transfers are really fast. They are probably the fastest step, the fastest reaction we'll see in the two semesters. And why is it so fast? Well, that proton is really easy to get to. There's nothing attached to it that gets in the way. There are no steric issues for that proton. So when your base or your nuclear file, whatever you want to call it, comes in and attacks that proton, it's easy to get to. That makes it, makes it a fast reaction. So I have here some species that has a lone pair. It could be described as a nuclear file. What else could we describe it as with a lone pair? A base. So what is a proton transfer? If you want to relate it to what you've seen already, it's an acid-base reaction. A proton transfer is simply an acid-base reaction. And they are everywhere. Okay, If you're chewing gum, eating anything right now, you're doing proton transfers. Right? All our metabolism requires proton transfers. Proteins give you the proton. We get proton transfers. We get chemistry. We get biochemistry. We get uh, you know, life, whatever. You. On the right-hand side, I could say this is a conjugate acid. I could say this is a conjugate base. But the basic idea here, the simple idea, is that I have pr transferred that hydrogen, that proton, to that oxygen. That is a proton transfer. Hold on, are you OK with that? Very good. I need two arrows for this particular type of proton transfer. I need this to show one bond forming. Why do I need that second arrow? Because I'd be breaking rules, wouldn't I? I'd give the hydrogen too many electrons. So it's the same answer. Keep an eye on what you're attacking. If it has six electrons, maybe you can bring one arrow in. If it has eight and you bring something else in, maybe you have to lose something. If you had to give me a term from that previous slide, what is this behaving as? Cl minus is taking off. What could you call it? A leaving group. It's exactly the same thing. 
If you see these things and you relate to acid-base chemistry and bring that with you, this isn't so bad. So thinking about next term, thinking about a lot of the chemistry that is required to get through 3720 and then head into biosynthesis, uh, this is nothing more fancy than a base coming in, taking off a hydrogen. And that is a proton transfer. This is a base going after a proton. So if you're attacking a proton and a proton seems to be moving around, that's probably a proton transfer. And that is the third type of arrow that you'll be concerned with. Joe. Uh, so would you say that that process is, um, would be uh, spontaneous if it were heated? You have to think about conditions, which is where we go on Monday. How do you make these things work? If they seem to be unfavorable, how do you make them work? This thing, this thing might need some help. It might need a solvent of an appropriate polarity to help this bromine break off, to help stabilize the carbol cation. Not only, only if it gets regenerated. If it gets consumed, it's not a catalyst. That's, that's chapter seven. Glorious detail on Monday. I mean, bring your, put your detail heads on on Sunday because Monday's all about detail. The last type. You will have fun with this. This is like Cedar Point on the nicest day of the year. I mean, this is fun, unless you don't like roller coasters, which I don't. Rearrangements. 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 Well, we're going to see lots of different instances where we generate these things, carbocations. And sometimes we generate a carbocation which isn't quite as good as it could be. And when a carbocation is generated, what it wants to be when it grows up is a better carbocation. Right? It wants to be a better carbocation. And often there's a pathway to become a better carbocation by doing something called a rearrangement. And that rearrangement is happening within the molecule. So we have a term for that. We can say intramolecular. Within two molecules, two coming together, that's intermolecular. Everything we did before this was intermolecular. Now this is an intramolecular process in which maybe a hydrogen moves or a carbon moves. The skeleton of the molecule, the framework, reorganizes itself. And this happens in a very logical way. If you have a cycle that's very strained and you were a three-membered ring, what would you rather be if you were a three-membered ring, Haldeman? If you were a three-membered ring, what would you rather be? A four-membered ring. See how this works? So you might open up. You might expand to become a four-membered ring, because that's not as bad, right? And we'll talk about stability of carbocations next, but this will happen in order to get to somewhere more stable. And it's independent of everything else, because it's in the same molecule. You don't need anything else from outside to make this work. So these rearrangements are kind of tricky. Basically, what we're looking at is the introduction of a term that will mean an awful lot. This is one of my favorite words. If you look at most of the stuff on my website, it's on hyperconjugation.com. I own the website hyperconjugation.com. I'm not going to apologize. This is the first definition of this term. Hyperconjugation is the donation of electron density from adjacent sigma bonds to an electron deficient species. Here are the carbocation. You will know this. You will go home and practice this in front of the mirror, in front of your friends, whatever it takes. And you will know this definition by Monday. Hyperconjugation is basically a carbocation right now, which needs some help, and it has some neighbors. And those neighbors are bonds. What are in bonds that carbocations need? Electrons. And the more of those bonds you have, the better. So if you only have a couple of those bonds, maybe you're not so good. If you have nine of those bonds, maybe that carbocation doesn't feel so bad about missing two electrons, because it's got neighbors that can help out. We'll talk about that in a bit more detail, but here's a depiction of it. There's a carbocation. It needs some help. Adjacent to that carbocation is a CH3 group. And each of these bonds, which is electron density, can help out. It's going to happen with all three of them because this thing is spinning around. But I have some help from the neighbor. That is the depiction of hyperconjugation. And the more of those neighbors you have next to the carbocation, the more stabilized that carbocation. And this is a fundamental principle. Some, some of the homework is to do with this, about why certain systems go in one direction and why other systems go in a different direction in a mechanism, even though they seem to be very similar. So hyperconjugation, I will, re I will reiterate on Monday, but it leads to this series. Bailey, you asked me this question before. This is the answer to that question. You listening? Sure. OK. We are thinking about rearrangements, and we are thinking about why this might happen and how it can happen, when it happens. 
Well, we have some definitions now. These need to be understood by Monday. A carbocation which only has three hydrogens attached is the worst of the lot. This is about the only time I'll ever draw this species in my class. Okay? We don't like them. We don't need to make them either because we have different pathways to get to products. But I don't have any neighbors. There are no bonds here, here, or here to help out with hyperconjugation. This slide might just cement that idea. You need to have bonds adjacent to the carbocation. If you don't, there's no help. So this is lousy. We don't like this at all. It's a smiley face for those of you, those of you who don't text. Now, if you, put a prime, if you put a group on here like a CH3, all of a sudden I've got three neighbors of this type that are close enough to help me out. So do we think this is more stable or less stable than the first one? More stable. Still not good. There will be alternative pathways for this molecule to react that don't require using a methyl carbocation or a primary carbocation. Why is it primary? The definition is the carbocation has one other carbon attached. If you replace one of those hydrogens again with another R group and you make this a couple of methyls like this and this, do you think that's better or worse? It should be better because now I've got six neighbors that can help me out. There is more electron density available to influence the carbocation structure. So this is better, and you will see these. Secondary carbocations are not bad. The best of the lot is the tertiary. Because now if these are methyl groups, how many adjacent bonds do I have? How many? Nine. Okay, these are great. We like these. So this is starting to get tricky because on Monday I'll say there's this sort of break. Some of these molecules over here don't do carbocation chemistry. Some of these molecules over here do do carbocation chemistry because they are stable enough to be achieved. If the molecule is not stable enough to be achieved, we won't go that direction. We'll go someplace else. That's where organic starts to get very tricky. So let's say right now, because of hyperconjugation, which is, and I will ask you this, if I meet you on the street anytime, right, in recitation, wherever, what is hyperconjugation? By Monday, you'll be able to tell me it's the donation of electron density from adjacent single bonds. Let's say it quickly. The more bonds you've got at the beta position, the better. Now, in terms of rearrangements, what does that mean? What, is, what are we trying to do here? Well, what type of carbocation is this? How many carbons are attached on that carbocation? Two. So I'm going to call that a secondary carbocation. If you were a secondary carbocation, what would you aspire to in your life? to be a tertiary carbocation, right? Big, bad tertiary carbocations. So that on the right, what is that? Primary, secondary, or tertiary? That's tertiary. We're learning this now. It's the first time maybe you've seen it, but you've got to count. You've got three carbons attached. That's a tertiary carbocation. Tertiary carbocations are better than secondary because they have more adjacent bonds. They have more help. So I want to be here because this is better. You don't need any reagents to do this. It's in the same molecule. It's intramolecular. And we will say that intramolecular reactions are fast, simply because everything's already there. Intramolecular. Everything's already there. You don't need to find anything else. Joe. Well, that's chapter eight. Right? And what, maybe you've read ahead, but the best reactions in this first semester are reactions that involve all of those different four types of steps and eliminations and rearrangements and nucleophilic attack and all this stuff. It's great. Yeah? It's like a different world. I want to go here because it's tertiary and it's better. How do I get there? Well, I have a choice. If you get this now, you're in good shape. I'm going to move something along from this carbon. And this is very much like you know, hyperconjugation, if you've ever been uh, in a, in a hurricane or whatever, or you've been to the beach when it's windy, and the, the trees are sort of bow bowing over. You seen this? Yeah? And you can imagine eventually if this thing just snaps and moves. That's what's happening in this rearrangement. Hyperconjugation is kind of, okay, we're close enough, we can help out, but hyper this rearrangement is, okay, boom, we're moving someplace. And what's happened here is a choice of either this bond with a pair of electrons moving, or one of these bonds with a pair of electrons moving across, physically moving. I have some pictures for you orbital pitches when we get there, but this is viable simply by thinking about orbitals overlapping in the same way we have. Now, why does the hydrogen move and not a methyl group? Any ideas? Go on. Nope. Anybody else? 
nope. These are good answers, and these are, you're starting to think like scientists. This is, you know, what we do in the lab is we sit there and go, what the hell happened there? And then you... Maybe. When we get to transition state theory, maybe. I'll stroke my beard, and maybe. Any ideas? If you took one of these methyl groups and you took it across there, what would be left here? What type of carbocation? You'd have a secondary carbocation left over. If you move an alkyl group, you have a secondary carbocation left. You started with a carbocation that was secondary. You didn't gain anything. If you move a hydrogen over, you get a tertiary cation. That's why that goes. Keep an eye on that one. All these rearrangements that you will see are logical. It's small rings going to bigger rings. It's secondary cations going to tertiary cations. Not the other way around. It would be, it, it'd be uh, silly to do the other way around because you'd be going uphill in energy. Doesn't make any sense? Read over the weekend. Let's make it make sense. This example is slightly different. It's a similar looking molecule, but we have a secondary cation. But I don't have a hydrogen to move. But I do have things to move, in this case, alkyl groups. So if I had a hydrogen, it would go. I don't. So I move one of my alkyl groups across. What is happening is this bond is moving across to form a new bond at the other carbon. It is not taking off and breaking away and then reattaching. It's all happening at the same time. What's the term for that? Concerted. This is a concerted rearrangement, a concerted migration. A lot more detail to come, but these are the basics. So our fourth type of arrow is a rearrangement. And the question can be asked again, how many arrows do I need? If I'm showing this bond being moved across to attach itself here, do I need a second arrow to compensate? No, because it only had six electrons. And there's no mystery here. If you start out with a positive charge over there, guess what you have to have over there? Positive charge. You have to balance the charges, right? So we've got the fourth type, the migration step. And what we can start to do is put them all together. So my last couple of minutes today, five minutes, we'll start seeing some of these things in action. This is where people start to drift off or they get into it because it's really explaining, you know, what's under the hood, how does this thing work, how do chemical reactions go? In that first reaction we're going to go from, in chapter 7, nucleophilic substitution. All great detail. Tons of detail. And we're going to say that we can start off these reactions by taking a substrate, in this particular case an alcohol, and adding it to a strong acid. How do you know HBr is a strong acid? You knew that earlier, right? You know it's got a negative pKa, it will protonate anything else. So if I go across to over here, we can imagine this now being the new species. What does that look like? What does that remind you of, of things that you know? Hydronium, H3O+. Plus. What was the pKa of hydronium? Negative 1.7, right? So that's a decent acid in its own right. So maybe it can go backwards. Maybe later on we'll start doing this, showing reversibility. But then this thing apparently, and get this, we're not making this stuff up. We get this. That's what you identify after you finish the experiment. So how do we get there? What's the pathway to get there? That's what we're trying to do here. Somehow, my OH has to go, and my BR has to come in. So what's my OH going to behave as? A leaving group. Now, if OH on its own breaks off, what would it become? It would become a base. It would become hydroxide. Is that a stable thing or an unstable thing? That's unstable. And you're never going to form two unstable things. You'd get a carbocation and you'd get hydroxide. That's not going to work. It's just too unstable. So that's why we protonate. That's why we put the proton on there, because when this thing breaks off, what does it become? Water. <coughs> water. It breaks off as a molecule of water, which is perfectly stable. And you're left with one unstable thing and one stable thing, and that's fine, and that will happen all the time. So here we get the migration. Why is that migrating? What type of carbocation is it? Secondary. What would it rather be when it grows up? Tertiary. There it is. So the point of this is to show you how this is put together. That first acid-base reaction is a proton transfer. This is the breaking off of a leaving group. This is a carbocation rearrangement. And then finally, to finish this off, what does this thing need most of all? It needs its octet, which can come about from something in the solution. And what's this behaving as? A nucleophile. So that nucleophile comes in, forms a bond right there, and that gives us the product. So you can apply these types of arrows to pretty much well, everything. You're not going to see rearrangements all the time. You're going to see a lot of proton transfers, a lot of nucleophilic attacks, a lot of um, leaving groups breaking off. Down at the bottom, different pathway. For some reason, this one seems to go in one step, concerted. 
In this example, I've got a delta positive carbon here, which might need some help. I've got a Cl minus, which is electron rich, therefore it's a nucleophile, and I'm going in. Why do I need two arrows? I'd be breaking the octet rule if I only used one. So what type of arrow is this? Nucleophilic attack. What type of arrow is that? Leaving group breaking off. Thinking about next term, I'm going to do these two slides, and then we'll start again on Monday. The mechanisms in the second term are way more complicated than what we are going to do now. But what we do now is the basis of what we do next term. So get it, please get it now. Please understand now. Lots of reactions such as saponification, how you make soap. How we've traditionally made soap on the planet has been through a reaction like this. Uh, we have some ester material, we have some base, and we go after this. And we have here, what type of arrow? Nucleophilic attack. This is also part of that nucleophilic attack. Why is that not a leaving group breaking off? Because it's not breaking off. Yes, it's bonded twice. You break one bond, you've still got it attached. It needs to break off to be a, a, a leaving group breaking off. This guy is now breaking off. And if I push this out by bringing this arrow in, that is the loss of a leaving group. On the right-hand side over here, what's the PK of that guy? Oh! What's the PK of this thing? Five. And this is basic, and what do I get from that? I get ORH like that. What's the PK of this guy? Try again. What's the PK of an alcohol? 16. Right, which side is favored, left or right? The right-hand side. So we now have proton transfer. Now I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to tell you this. There are about 100 of these things, more than 100 of these things. You have a choice. You came into this class with a certain major. My favorite are the biology majors. I love biology. I hate chemistry. Well, guess what? Biologists have to take three years of chemistry. Chemists have to take absolutely no biology. So if you're a biologist and you hate chemistry, not going to work because biology builds off of chemistry. So with that in mind, you've got a lot of stuff to do. Have a go over the weekend. Email me with questions. I'll see you on Monday.